Oh. Welcome, Adam Lowe, to the show. Thank you so much for joining us. How have you been over these oh, past thank, few weeks? Thank you for having me. Um, you know, it's been really weird. I think lots of people are um, struggling or are challenged by, by what's happening. Um, I've been trying to make the best of it. Um, obviously, I can't do any kind of performance work or anything involving, you know, going into schools or venues or anything like that. But I've been focusing a lot on my writing. Um, and hopefully um, I have finished my poetry collection now. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, so I've sent that off to my publisher. Um, he said he's just finishing some indexing and then he's going to look at it. So fingers crossed he'll be happy with it. And, and you know, if any... that it's given me a little bit of chance to sit down and just work on it really and get it finished yeah um yeah it has given us a chance to pause um and kind of figure out well most of us i've been doing crazy stuff <laughs> but given us a, a bit of a chance to pause and kind of refocus um so let's just tell us a bit about your creative history um so you're a writer i mean we met um it was Madden's Freedom Studios Street Voices, right? Yes. Way yeah. back in the day. So just tell us a bit yeah. about your creative history and what you've done since then. Yeah, so I'm a writer. Um, I also do a bit of performing and I do teaching as well. Um, so, yeah, I think it was 2009, maybe, or 2008, when we did Street Voices 2 at, um, at, at Freedom Studios in Bradford. So that's a really long time ago. And that was kind of when I first started my journey of writing professionally. Um, I've been writing for magazines since I was about 16, 17, starting with my college magazine. But it, it wasn't until round about, yeah, 2008, 2009, that I started really trying to focus on my creative work and um, started taking part in mentoring schemes and things like that. Um, over the years, I've found that as a black writer, um, and you probably are aware of this too, that I've kind of had to multi-skill mm -hmm. so that I can actually make money. Um, so I don't just write, that's why I do a little bit of everything. And, um, you know, with my poetry, I might perform that myself, but I've also done um, directing. Um, I've done two um, RTYDS courses. So that's um, Regional Young Theatre Directors Scheme. Um, which is based at um, the Royal Exchange in Manchester, but they kind of host those um, across across the north. Um, and I've done two of those directing schemes. One was for um, disabled directors and one was for um, directors of colour. And, and that was, I found, really empowering and it gave me kind of another perspective on how to create work. Um, one of those was part of a project called Slate um, that I ran in, the, in, in Manchester. So Slate was supporting um, black and Asian artists across the whole of the north of England. That's uh, Eclipse, um, right? Eclipse. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's homed by Eclipse Theatre. Um, so it was set up by Dawn Walton, who's a bit of a legend. Mm -hmm. um, and hundreds hundreds of black artists have been supported through that scheme so i was really really proud to be part of that and i was running uh, manchester for a year for that project um it's currently kind of reached the end of its funding cycle um but we we worked with loads of different artists we um put work in front of you know thousands of people we had exhibitions we had performances we had a showcase of, of work we had residentials um, and there's not really been that kind of involved, in-depth, long-term investment in black and artists of colour um, for such a long time, or mm -hmm. if ever, that I was really kind of proud to be doing that. Mm -hmm. um, so I did all of that. I've been doing teaching at Lancaster University at the, um, sorry, at the University of Central uh, Lancashire, which is um, Preston University, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not Lancaster. I always say Lancaster, but it's not <laughs> because it's UCLan, and then University of Leeds, um, where I teach on the MA course. Um, oh, I've been wow. at Leeds for, I think, four years now. Um, yeah, and ah. I joined UCLan, yeah, I joined UCLan just before COVID-19 hit, so most of that teaching was done online. Oh, wow, um, so you've been teaching while you've been locked up as well, oh, that's crazy. Yeah, 
it's been crazy and uh, I've just been trying to do as much as I can within that time. Um, I got a commission from um, your local arena, um, which is a project um, that is kind of exploring the local arena show that used to be on BBC, I believe it was. And they've been working with Bradford Literature Festival and Speaking Volumes to commission new responses to these old films. Mm -hmm. So um, I took part in something that was called Three Faces of Bradford. And they were basically sh three short films about Bradford artists, one of whom was Andrea Dunbar, the playwright who wrote Rita Sue and Bob Two. Um, and, and I was just really kind of taken by, um, by Andrea Dunbar and her family's story. And so I wrote this poem about um, Buttershaw, uh, the Buttershaw estate. Um, a lot of my friends um, lived in, in Buttershaw when I was, uh, when I was at university, when I was at college, sorry, and when I was at high school. Um, a lot of my friends from Bradford, that's where they all came from. So I kind of felt really connected to her story and I ended up writing a poem about that. Um, so it's just been, even though we've had the lockdown and even though I've had time to kind of work on my own stuff, I've still had other things kind of coming in. So yeah. I've been lucky in that sense. You That's know? great. That's yeah. really good. Um, yeah, I think particularly for voiceover artists and writers, it's kind of been a little bit of a, a, a different world than it has for other people. Yeah. Um, so we've just, we've just come to the end of um, Pride Month. Yeah. And I just wanted to ask, like, um, being um, a, a black person in the LGBTQ community, um, you know, those of us who are not part of that community are, are learning all the time about its history. But um, can you tell us a bit about the history uh, of um, black people leading some of the um, LGBTQ plus um, kind of reforms and, and things like that? Yeah, I mean... Very broad was, question, I know, but I just think it's interesting for us all to know the history. I think it is, and I think it's really important that we know that actually there was a huge amount of crossover, um, especially between LGBT rights um, and the civil rights movement in America. Um, a lot of the movers and shakers in both movements were queer people, um, and that can't be said enough. A lot of it was sort of black lesbians, uh, black trans people, black drag queens, um, you know, on, on, on both sides and I think that's really important to remember. So the Stonewall riots which kind of kicked everything off and that's why we mark, um, that's why we mark Pride Month in June because it happened in June. Um, they were riots that started at a mafia owned pub in uh, New York and basically they were getting pestered all the time. Um, the police would come in and do raids and things and it was primarily a space where people of colour um, and gender non-conforming people, so drag queens, um, you know, butch dykes, that kind of thing, would all be hanging out. And some of them will have been considered themselves trans, but maybe under different terminology because the language has obviously changed. Um, but you know, they were they saw themselves as being persecuted, and this was the only kind of safe haven they had. So when the police came and they kind of, um, it was like the the, the straw that broke the camel's back mm -hmm. um people started fighting back and the people that were involved such as Marsha p johnson were all black people um, and a lot of them were either drag queens or trans people um or lesbians and so that's what kind of kicked off the movement that we have now and pride is actually a celebration of um those stonewall riots the first ever pride that happened in the world happened one year after the stonewall riots to kind of commemorate what had happened there um, and that was all you know primarily people of colour so uh, Marsha P Johnson was black um, her, the P stood for pay it no mind um, so you would say what does the P stand for Marsha and she'd be like pay it no mind um, <laughs> she was quite sassy she wrote poetry um, she was you know really well accepted on on the scene but also she got a lot of stick even from other LGBT people because she was so out and proud and because of the way that she dressed and she was so flamboyant and she would wear a wig so she would get you know other gay people walking past and being like oh what is that you know mm -hmm. and my experience is that that you know that still exists in yeah. some parts of the gay community um there's some parts of it that are very middle class and very white and very male and very cisgender and there can sometimes be a bit of um, a boys club in some parts of it and some parts of it. There are even gay Tories, which I find completely ridiculous. 
um, but I have met them. But, you know, um, I'm not one of those people that can say I've never kissed a Tory. <laughs> but I can say that without a doubt, they were all dreadful in bed. Um, <laughs> Um, so, you know, I think, I think there has been a huge um, impact from black and brown people in the queer movement and also queer people in the civil rights movement. And so we need to kind of remember that, really. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so just kindly to touch on um, the state of the arts at the minute. Um, I know we've yeah. recently got our, um, our roadmap to uh, where we can go with the arts. Um, yeah. Um, how, where do you think we're going to go? I mean, it's, I guess it's difficult to say, but where would you like it to go from now? I know where I would like it to go. Um, I've actually been really impressed with how quickly everything's gone online and how accessible everything has become. But at the same time, it's been quite frustrating because a lot of people have been saying, you know, make these things accessible, um, before that. And so I, I've got um, a, a chronic illness called ME. And so that, that limits your energy. And so for me, actually traveling to things can be like the biggest barrier because if I take a journey and it takes me a couple of hours to get somewhere, that can then wipe me out for the next week. So people aren't necessarily aware of that. Um, and so I don't always go to things anymore. And I used to go to everything. I used to be that person who attended every gig, every workshop, you know, because that, that was how I networked and I made all my connections. And that's how I met everybody. But I can't really do that as much anymore. And I have to be really... Um, I have to be really careful with my time. So the second that everything became online, I could suddenly engage with all these things that I'd kind of felt left out with, out of for a while. My only worry is that as soon as everything reopens, everyone is just going to go back to the way that it was. Yeah. I think a lot of people will want to forget that COVID ever happened mm -hmm. and just go back to life as it was before COVID. Mm -hmm. But I'm hoping that enough people have kind of experienced it and thought, you know what, actually, it doesn't make sense for us all to be rushing through rush hour to get to this event or to get to this reading or this workshop or whatever. Um, and that more stuff will now be held online because of that. Yeah, access, accessibility has been a huge thing um, and, it, and it's just proven how easy it is to do, um, yeah. how, how little um, it affects or how how taxing it is not for an organization to allow people to see things online so yeah i'm hoping yeah. we don't we don't revert back to exactly how it was before um exactly. so briefly just to touch on the um black lives matter um yeah. movement um kia um in his in his great wisdom um kind of made some comments the other day um and not necessarily what do you feel about his comments but like how 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 do you feel the black lives matter movement in the uk can kind of move forward with uk issues yeah um so i think keir starmer kind of really disappointed me with his comments i think um i mean i kind of knew that that's what we were getting when keir starmer came in um i'm not sure that the competition was particularly great among the leader you know the leadership for the Labour Party anyway and we do have this self-destructive thing and I'm saying this as a lifelong Labour supporter and my mum used to be a, a Labour Party councillor for 29 years and um, one of my great 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 grandmothers was um, a Labour councillor um, back in the early um, 20th century and I think she became a councillor in the late 19th century so it's literally hundreds of years in our family um, but there's been this self-destructive thing that they want to eradicate all the socialism within the party or they want to get rid of anyone who is on the left. And for me, Labour has always had social democracy, um, you know, within, within its, its makeup. It's always had people to the left and it's really damaging to kind of try and bring that to a centrist kind of place that's, you know, tory light really. So I knew that that was kind of what we were going to get. But it just disappointed me when he went and proved us right, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and it just felt that actually you've just let down all of your black members, um, especially at a time when I've been having this conversation with so many black people who are saying we're really pissed off with Labour at the moment because, you know, um, I appreciate that that Jewish people are calling them out and so they've been trying to uh, appease Jewish people and they've been trying to um, make it right with them but they haven't done the same with us and actually I know black people that feel that they've been thrown under the bus um, so that you know Keir Starmer can win, win 
over the media in terms of anti-Semitism. And at the same time, the Tories get away with so much and it's so egregious and so obvious that actually a bit of you is really annoyed saying, why are we arguing about, you know, this one thing that that Labour Party is getting wrong when the Tory is getting wrong everything you know and we're not talking about that at all and actually it's a nice distraction from everything that the Tory party is doing wrong and I made a, a post on Facebook um, the other day because obviously Black Lives Matter UK had tweeted something and it was just one Twitter group and I knew straight away what was going to be the the bugbear because there were a couple of issues within what they said one was that they kind of suggested that there was like a conspiracy to stop people talking about Israel in the in the papers and that's always going to be a touchy trope to to mention and I think it's something that we probably should avoid because it is something that anti-semitic people will use yes. and the other was that they were specifically talking about zionism in inverted commas as something that is equivalent to israeli foreign policy and israeli annexation of palestine and the policy of netanyahu and mm -hmm. actually that's really dangerous as well because i know a lot of jewish people i've got jewish people in my family you know uh, my cousin's children are black jewish people um, and actually Zionism is much wider than just an Israeli issue. It's mm -hmm. about feeling a connection to a homeland that maybe you've lost and that you want to return to. It's about being able to self-determination, uh, self-determinate as a kind of, um, as a unique ethnic group. Mm -hmm. And actually everybody has the right to self-determination. It's within the EU charter. So that's, that's a kind of a dog whistle, mm -hmm. if you like. Um, and yeah. it's a word that on the, on the surface of it, seems like it's a, it's a sensible word to use, or it's an okay word to use. But actually, what a lot of Jewish people will say is that when people mention Zionism or anti-Zionism or saying, I am opposed to Zionism, what they inevitably usually mean is that they are anti-Semitic, or mm -hmm. it then brings in people that are anti-Semitic that then start feeding off that and saying all this hostile stuff. Yeah. So I knew straight away when they'd said it what was wrong. Right. But at the same time, it felt like all of that was being weaponized to then turn black people and Jewish people against each other. Yeah. And obviously there are black Jewish people as well. So, you know, yeah. not that they are completely separate groups of people. Um, but I find that really problematic. And actually I made this Facebook status update saying, you know, don't let the racists win. You know, if you disagree yeah. with what BLM UK tweeted, there's one group that doesn't necessarily represent the whole of the Black Lives Matter movement in the UK. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Call them out for it or be pissed off with them or unfollow them or whatever. But it doesn't mean that that means we suddenly switch off to Black Lives Matter. Yes. And vice versa, just because there have been some people like Matt Lucas, who is Jewish, who have said, oh, well, this has now meant that, you know, and this isn't what Matt Lucas has said, but other people have said, oh, well, I'm not going to support Black Lives Matter now because of this. Part of me thinks, well, is, are we now just playing into that, um, you know, divide and, and conquer thing where we're yeah. now saying, I'm not going to side with the, the Jews and the Jews are saying, I'm not going to side with the Blacks. We're going to both go separately and, you know, united we stand and you know divided we fall absolutely. and that's as simple as it is really yeah absolutely when it comes to fascism we have to all work together i've been saying this for weeks um and yeah it's interesting isn't it how the black lives matter movement as a movement or as an ideology and as an idea has now become a brand um and yes there are organizations but the organization is not the ideology or, or, exactly. or the, you know it's 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 exactly dangerous territory you know, it, it's a hash, it, you know it's a hashtag it's like it's like hashtag me too it's like hashtag times up like obviously people have created these things but they are bigger than the people who created them yeah. and they are bigger than the spokespeople that claim to speak on behalf of them yeah. and it's the same you know it's exactly the same with the jewish community that i'm sure that you know matt lucas doesn't represent every single one of those people and i'm sure that there are loads of jewish people out there that haven't done blackface and made comedy programs taking the piss out of you know black people and asian people and whatever else that, that they did and disabled people 
as on Little Britain. So it's unfair to kind of assume that these so-called spokespeople speak for everybody. Um, and really coming together is what's important. And we shouldn't let ourselves get sidetracked. You know, black people shouldn't start getting anti-Semitic and, and Jewish people shouldn't start being anti-black because actually that's playing into the racist handbook. You know, that's what yeah. they want us to do. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for that. That was really, really um, informative and uh, yeah, inspiring. Um, yeah, I'm sorry if I witted on for ages. No, there. no, because you taught me some things that I, that I mean, you know, we, it's all about education, isn't it really? And listening yeah. to each other and learning. And the minute we stop listening and stop trying to learn is when we, we end up with the situation that we're in now, fascism on the rise. Exactly. Um, and there are things that I didn't know. And I, I will admit that I freely admit that I've, I've got things wrong in the past you know i remember having a couple of debates on facebook with my good friend grace who is who is jewish and i'd said a couple of things um that i didn't think at the time were anti-semitic saying things like oh it's not anti-semitic to be anti-zionist which is like a buzzword it's one of those whistle yeah, yeah. dog whistles that people say but actually the people that usually say that are anti-semitic but it's just that everybody else kind of picks that up as something and you think of it as just a useful shorthand but actually it's not and so she kind of explained to me what zionism was and what it meant to a person and then i did my own research and i went off and like you know zionism is a concept like the idea of zion itself is something that even black people have a connection to in yes. certain communities because in rastafarianism you know yep. there's, there's the idea of zion as well and it's this idea that we we have a home that we've lost that we want to reclaim and actually mm -hmm. how could i in all consciousness say you know that is a bad thing and that wasn't what my problem was my problem was actually a very specific thing which is um you know benjamin Netanyahu saying i'm gonna annex this country even though it's illegal um you know saying i don't recognize palestine as a state even though the un does recognize it as a state and those are very specific things and benjamin netanyahu does not represent the whole of Israel yes. even, and he doesn't represent all Jewish people. And yeah. there are lots of Israeli people that protest against him and lots mm -hmm. of Jewish people beyond that, that, you know, are not related to Israel or don't feel that it represents them. And so you've got to remember that, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, so lastly, um, I guess it's difficult to say because we don't know what's going to happen. I mean, we're, we're, we've got local lockdowns looming, but what are you hoping to do um, in the near future with your writing or directing or anything like that? Um, well, so I, as I say, I've submitted my poetry collection, um, which I'm very excited about, although I did have a nightmare last night that uh, my editor got back in touch with me and said it was absolutely dreadful. Um, <laughs> oh, um, but I, I, he won't, he won't say that at all, because I know him really well, Jeremy's lovely. Um, and he works at People Tree Press, where I, I also do social media and marketing stuff. So that's not going to happen. But that's going to come out eventually. And when that does, I'm hoping to um, do a tour, maybe do some online events, um, you know, do some workshops and things around that. It'll probably be a year or two though before it comes out, which right. I'm fine with. Um, other than that, um, I will be teaching again, hopefully in October um, at the University of Leeds. Um, mm -hmm. That's where I do the MA writing for performance and publication. And it's really nice to kind of teach on that course because I studied on that course. Yeah like 12 years ago myself so it's kind of giving back to it yeah. um and i and as as i say i've done the uh, the poem about butter shaw um which is on the website for um your local arena um and that's about andrea dunbar um i will send the link over to you yes please you yeah that'd be great um and just gonna have some poems published in a few other places hopefully coming out next month there will be uh, no this month now because it's july july now yeah um, yeah, there is going to be a new issue of Ambit magazine that will have one of my poems in. And I suspect there will be a few other things that trickle out um, online in the next few months as well. Amazing. Busy, busy bee, as always. Exactly, um, yeah. Well, thank you so much. Really appreciate you coming on the show. Um, and I, I miss you. I've not seen you in so long, but yeah, thank you. Well, I miss you. It'll be so great to catch up sometime. Yeah, definitely. As soon as this is over. This poem's called Bone Railroad. Um, I read this one at my, well, my cousin read this at my granddad's funeral. Um, so it has quite a lot of um, sentiment behind it. Um, it was around the time that we were talking about the reparations that were paid to slave owners after they um, had to give up their slaves 
and we'd kind of had done some research and it was all in the papers that people like David Cameron and obviously his family had profiteered from having slaves and things and it just really kind of pissed me off and um, I remember reading an article talking about how um, money from the slave trade was used to build the railways in Britain and so I started imagining um, these the bones that were kind of left at the bottom of the ocean by all these bodies that were thrown over because the slaves that died on slave ships would have just been thrown over and a lot of them would still chain together at that point and um, sometimes if one person died on the chain they would just toss everybody over because it was easier than separating the chains to get rid of the dead ones um, so people were literally treated like like property and then they claimed on the insurance because they said that they lost the property at sea um, and so I had this vivid image in my head of all these bones forming a railway underneath the sea. So this is called Bone Railroad. I will clutch your bones together into a coral palace at the bottom of the sea. I will sing hymns to celebrate you in the vault built from your ribcage, the stained glass I will blow from your dreams. Who cast you down here like a bone railroad? From Africa's west coast to the Americas, the Caribbean. Whales will worship you. I will come down and sit upon your coral throne and remember who you were. I will unearth your stories, find the ships that discarded you and sink them all. So the next poem I'm going to read is called Vardavat. Um, it's got a completely different energy. Um, it's quite camp. It's written in Polari, which is a, um, a kind of gay slang. I'm not going to um, translate it. It's enough to know that it's quite filthy, and I'm sure you can guess what it's about. Aunt Nell, the Patterflash, and Gardy Lou. Bijou, she trolls bold on Lally's slicker stripes down Medilly. She minces past the brandy latch to Varda dolly dish for trade, silly with oomph and taste to park. She'll reef you on her vagaries, should you be so lucky. She plans to gamma steam her and tip the brandy, but give her starters and she'll be happy to give up for the other. May we, she's got your number, ducky. She'll cruise a nome with fabulosa bod, regard the scotches, the thews, the rod, Chappering a kaze for the trick. Slick, she bamboozles the ogles of old Lily Law. She swishes through town, half Michigana, and blows Lamours through the oxy at all the passing trade. She'll sass a drink of Aqua de Vida, wallop with Vera in claw. Nelliada her voce's chant, till the noche with panache becomes journo, till the sparkle allows the munge out of guard. But shada she's got nada, she aches for an affair, and dreams of pogi through years of nicks. The game Nanty works, not for her. She prefers a head or back slum to the meat rack. Fact is, she'll end up in the chaperon case of Jennifer Justice. What is this queer ken she's in? Give her an auntie or a mama, the bones isn't needed just yet. Though she's a bimbo bit of hard, she's royal and tart and girl. You know vardering her eek is always boner. Okay, so um, that one was... Uh, I love that. Part of that. Yeah, loads of... Do you know what? I always get asked for that one as well because it's quite a fun one. And love so it. people quite enjoy it. Okay, so the next one I will read um, is... Boy Machine. Um, this one is in an anthology called Filigree, which you can get from People True Press. Um, I've had a couple of nice reviews about this poem recently, so I'm feeling good about it. Um, it's called Boy Machine. One. Last night I dreamed of Icarus, stitching wings of silk and feather and wax. He stretched the thatch over a, a lightweight wooden frame, the way a lover's embrace covers a starved man with flesh. Last night I fevered with thoughts of him. I could taste the cleft of his buttocks, feel the swim of salt water swept down his limbs. 
I flew closer. Two. In his workshop, Leonardo dreams of a boy machine lifted, held up against the sky to wink like chiseled flint, a specimen jewel. Leonardo imagines a world that moves without hands. He thinks of wheels that spin kingdoms. Leonardo is in love. I bolt the wings to my forearms, vast blades collected from helicopters, edging like rotary petals. I thread wire along the length of my veins, fire muscle with electricity, lightning from cumulonimbus gods. I am a spark ready to fly. I climb onto the cottage roof, wings aimed like a weather vane, stare at the rushing distances of twilight and take off. Scissor bird, rocket man, missile launched for space through pewter skies. So that one was Boy Machine. Um, I think the last one that I'm going to read is called Jezebel Guilty Queen. Let me see if I can find it. Yeah, got it here. Okay. Um, so this is the last one, I promise. Jezebel Guilty Queen. You call me Jezebel, temptress, false idol in shallow spotlight, peddler of blasphemy and unnatural sex. You call me guilty, unsuited, shock slut of back alleys, siren seed spilling in the thrashing of night. You call me a queen, paint me Anne Boleyn, paste on my makeup, sharp set and glittering. These pearls I clutch as sexy rosaries. Before you silence me, know this, though headless, I'll sing, I'll go down in history. <laughs>